Heavenly Father, today we are grateful for all you are, the God who is and the God of the living, the great I am. Your character is unchanging. You are the epitome of perfect holiness and love. Because of who and all you are, we believe and trust in you. Your truthfulness is indisputable and your power is established, not just for the majestic works by your hand, but for the pure glory of your nature. Today we worship you. We come before you and we ask that you just open up our ears and our hearts and our mind to your word so that the word may saturate us and so we will be able to meditate on your word later on today. Amen. Okay, ladies, let me just pop this up on my computer quickly so I can make sure it's going great. Where is it? Ugh, it's always a problem. <laughs> I hope you ladies are having a great morning. It is a little rainy here where I live, so hopefully it's not too bad where you live. Um, but the weather has been pretty nice, shockingly, which I'm happy about. But we are diving into chapter 3 today. Let me know if this camera setup is better for you guys. Um, I have my tripod on a table since I have purchased a larger table. I don't know why I can't. Oh, here it is. Yeah, but I had got my tripod. No problem, Vicky. I noticed that seems to be the issue. So what I'm going to do is, um, right after I do this live video, I'm actually going to make the group public for a few hours so that I can download um, Esther's chapter 1 through 3. And I'm actually going to upload them onto YouTube because I have been asked um, if I could do that just because a lot of people are having issues with the Facebook videos for some reason. So I'm definitely going to um, download them and then upload them to YouTube. So they should all be up by what's today wednesday they should all be up by friday hopefully um i just have to download the three parts of chapter one then i have to download chapter two and then this live video session and then i'll upload them throughout the week up until friday so hopefully that'll help you guys um who are having seems to be having issues with watching it on facebook so but yeah let me know if this setup works if you guys need the uh focus to be a little closer on the words and um yeah so i have my utensils of course always the same and why is my computer not opening up this video there we go but um i have my utensils they're always the same crayola super tips marker um the crayola twistable pencils the sharpie smear guard highlighters and i'm actually going to be using two of the um mild liners from zebra because I really, really like these. They're so freaking adorable and cool. And they do come with the pointed tips, pointed ends. So, I actually like that this camera is auto-focusing. I don't know why, but whatever. <laughs> and I have my pen, of course. My postage, just because it's only 15 verses and I'm probably not going to... I'm going to need more space than this, basically. Um, I have my large post-it note, my emoji crying face, and then this one with the arrows. All of these I got from Walmart, so. Let's jump in. I have my coffee. Hopefully you guys cannot hear that running upstairs. My landlord um, has kids upstairs, nieces and nephews and her own kid. But um, I think that's her nephew running upstairs. I'm not sure. But, um, yes. If you have any questions, I will most likely try to answer them at the end unless it's pertaining to something that I'm going over just because I can't see my phone since my phone is so high up for me on the tripod and looking at my computer everything is just running really slow or like it lags behind um, which is how I think it's coming across to you guys so I'm going to try to keep looking at the comment section of my computer but we're going to dive right into this so we're going to read verses 1 through 6 this is Haman's plot, Haman's plot against the Jews. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the Agite, Agite the son of Hamedatha. I'm going to assume that's how you pronounce that name. Mind you, I was listening to the audio um, recordings of this chapter 
all night and still can't remember how to pronounce some of these names. But um, the son of Hamidatha and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. When the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, he would not listen to them. They told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. Verse 5. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. But he disdained to lay his hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. So let me know if it's coming up clear, you guys, because for some reason on my computer, as I'm watching it, it doesn't look clear. Um, but on my actual camera... The footage is really, really sharp and clear. So I don't know if it's just my computer or what. Yeah, like on my phone, it looks like you can see everything. So let me know if you guys can see this because I'm not sure why it looks like this on my computer. Let me see if I can fix some settings around quickly. Mm, quality. I'm just fixing the settings on my um, computer just so that I can see this video footage. Yeah, it only comes up to 360p on my computer for some reason. Okay, take it off focus. Let's see. Yeah, I can't even. <laughs> um, nope, that's flash. This is not working. Let's see. Um, I don't want to put a frame on this. I don't want to do anything else but just... Okay, you know what? I'm going to lower the camera a bit. Tell me if lowering the camera helped because I can't take it off of autofocus now. So just let me know if that's helping you out a bit. Okay, Angela, no problem. I'm just going to um, upload everything to YouTube because it seems to be having issues doing it this way. Okay, Tanya. Don, does this work better for you? The same for you, Nora. Is this better? Okay. Yeah, Betty, you should only see the part where it says chapter three, um, just because that's how I have it positioned right now. Okay, Don. But yeah, um, Betty, just the part, this, basically this little section here, you should see. Um, I'll be moving the Bible up, of course, as we go along. But um, I'm going to jump in now. And, of course, the first thing that I do is circle words that I want to define. So, I think I only had a few. I had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words that I wanted to define. Um, words, of course, some of them I already know. Some of them I don't know. 
but I serve them anyway just for a better understanding. So I have promoted that I circled. I circled agite. I circled where is it? Mm, homage. I circled transgress. I also circled fury and disdained. Now, of course, Fury is kind of like Wrath. I know in the King James Version, it says Wrath. I'm not sure what it says in other translations, but um, I know that Fury is basically substituted for Wrath in the King James Version. Okay, buddy, awesome. All right, Stacy. Let me see if I can get my screen to go split screen so that everything looks better tell you the power of technology guys <laughs> um nope what's going on okay so for promoted um it just means to make great or powerful and I'm just going to write that on a sticky note because I have too much to write today. So, um, this is in view. Promoted. To make great. Or powerful the next word is agite Alrighty then. So agite is um oh sorry. I know I forgot something. I also circled Heyman. <laughs> so Heyman is um the name is of Persian origin. So Persian origin. It means magnificent. And he is the prime minister of the king. Prime minister. Okay. So for promoted, I have to make or great, I'm sorry, to make great or powerful. I also circled Heyman's name, and it's basically Persian origin. It also means magnificent, and he is the prime minister to the king. And to look up Heyman's name, um, it wasn't in the Strong's Dictionary, unfortunately. So I had to use Blue Letter Bible, and I'm actually going to do a video, a short video of how I used that. Um, but use the Smith's Dictionary on Blue Letter Bible because they have the Strong's, but the Strong's still doesn't, like I said, have the definition. So, um, yeah, it's a Persian name meaning magnificent and Haman is the prime minister to the king. I'm just pausing to see if I see any questions. Okay, agite, there's a few things to that. So, the name itself means to overtop. Well, it means I will overtop, sorry. It means I will overtop. And it's basically a descendant from the royal family of the 
Amalekite. <laughs> I'm probably saying that wrong, but it is a descendant. from the royal family of the Amalekites is how I'm going to pronounce that. I'm probably butchering how you say that name, but yep. <laughs> So the next word I have is over here, which is homage, sorry. It's homage. So I'm just gonna write the word. So homage, in the Webster's Dictionary, it basically means an expression of high regard or to show respect to. Um, in the King James translation, the word homage is actually um, used as reverence so in the King James version it says to um what does it say it says paid reverence to Haman so it's basically meaning to bow down or worship so I'm gonna go with the um, Hebrew definition of reverence just because that's what um, this is really referring to as far as the people bowing down and worshiping Haman rather than just giving him respect um, I don't think it was more so respect. It was just them giving the praise because they were commanded to. So I'm going to write to bow down and you guys might hear my siblings. Um, a few of them are home to bow down or worship and then expression of high regard my handwriting is going to look a little crazy just because of how I have the camera set up and I don't think I can put my arm in but well I'm going to try and hopefully not knock over the camera no i can't write like that okay that's weird um the next word i had was transgress and in the webster's dictionary it basically means to violate a command or law to go beyond a boundary of limit and according to the strong's dictionary or the strong's concordance the hebrew meaning is to alienate alter bring over or carry over so i'm going to formulate a definition using both the Hebrew and the English definition so it's to violate a command or law alienate or alter it yeah Don I noticed a lot that um, the strong's dictionary just the strong's concordance I say dictionary because it's a, a dictionary in a sense but um let me grab mine it's interesting that they don't really mention a lot of people's names so I'm just gonna look his up again just pop this in the camera real quick um and look for Heyman so I'm gonna try to get this in the frame Ooh, okay so here it says Heyman prime minister under King Ahasuerus and then he's in Esther so they have all the times that he was popped he popped up in Esther and his number is 2001 so I'm just going to quickly flip there so you guys can see what I was talking about. Now, I'd actually be shocked if it all of a sudden now had it. Maybe I couldn't see it. <laughs> but from what I remember, it wasn't there. 
I had to look it up in the Smith's Dictionary on um, Blue Letter Bible. So, 2001. Yeah, okay. It's way down here, so let me move this out of the way. So, okay, hopefully you guys can see. 2001, Haman. Uh, a Persian visor and um a, i believe that's what that says visor <laughs> visor is basically a prime minister so it doesn't have any other reference to another word there's no other definition except for that and um you would actually have to look up that word itself but i did and it basically means prime minister so there's no true meaning for his name <laughs> So, like I said, I'm going to do a video um, on how I use Blue Letter Bible. And then probably on my YouTube channel, I'm going to go into depth on how I use each of my resources. Because I know they can be complicated. And the little mini videos I do are not the best as far as, like, really helping you to understand how to use the tools that I use. So, but, yeah. Transgress. Okay. The next word is Fury. So it's basically intense, disordered, and often destructive rage or wrath. So, I mean, there's really no other definition besides that one, so. Intense, disordered, often destructive, rage and then the last word was disdained probably not gonna fit on here but we're gonna squeeze it on this post-it so that all the definitions can be here um disdained is a feeling of contempt for someone or something regarded as unworthy or inferior and it's basically to despise so i'm just gonna write to despise on here because I have no space to write everything else to despise. But again, disdained is a feeling of contempt for someone or something regarded as unworthy or inferior. Which in this case would make sense because Haman is now the prime minister. He's over all the other officials in the king's court. And Mordecai is a simple Jew to him. So he feels like this Mordecai person is inferior to him being the prime minister. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and I'm just going to go in my highlighters. Because you guys know I like to highlight and make everything match. So, hey men. Did I say match? I meant coordinate well so that I can see it and not be confused. We're going to go with transgress for the green. Green for transgress, I mean. Oh. And hopefully I can finish this before my fiancé comes, because he'll be coming over. But, uh, homage in purple. I'm gonna take the pink for promoted. I'm probably going to have to ask my brother to be quiet. So give me one second, ladies. Oh, Lord. I hope you guys didn't hear my brother just now, but I'm back. Um, he didn't realize I was recording, but I'm going to use the orange for fury. Yellow for agite. And then I'm going to use this beautiful, beautiful gray color. This is the mild liner from Zebra, and it's in the color mild gray. They do, I heard that they sell these in a complete 15 pack at Target, so I'm probably going to have to go to Target soon and find them because I got mine for 
um, with all three, all 15 shades. So, I really like these. They're really good highlighters. And that is the first sticky note. So now on to the actual notes and underlining and stuff like that. Um, so after these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Heyman. I'm going to underline that part that says King Ahasuerus promoted Heyman. Skipping down to verse 2, I'm going to underline where it says Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead. <laughs> no, the son of uh, Hamethra. I'm going to underline that. I'm going to go... Let me just read this through because I'm doing too much right now. <laughs> I'm going to go about this the way I normally would because. Oh, really? No problem, Cindy. It'll definitely be up on YouTube, okay? So no problem. To anybody who's having problems watching it now, just I'll post a link to the YouTube channel where you can find the video once I um upload it because... You, Facebook is just having problems. But, um, you read the Jews would cheer, blot out his, blot his name out during the reading. Really? That's actually interesting, Dawn. And I, I would understand why. He tried, he did, Haman did try to, um, kill them all. <laughs> but, um, okay, verse 2. And all the kings had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai, sorry, verse 2. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. I'm going to underline that. And I'm also going to underline... Hmm... All the king's servants who were at the gate bowed down and paid homage. Skipping down to verse 3 now. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? So I'm going to underline that question of why do you transgress the king's command? Verse 4, And when they spoke to him day after day, he would not listen to them. They told him. Haman, in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. So I'm going to underline, he would not listen to them. They told Haman, and then I'm also going to underline the part where it says, for he had told them he was a Jew. Verse 5, and when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. I'm going to underline that last part with Haman was filled with fury. Verse 6. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. I'm going to underline that por portion. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews. The people of Mordecai throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. So I'm going to underline Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai. Okay, so now I'm going to write my notes. I'm going to write on this post-it because it's going to be better to do so. I'm sorry guys, I think my camera just flipped. It sure did. Oh. Yeah, so today we seem to be having some technical difficulties with this, and now it's completely zoomed out. Oh my gosh. And I don't know how to zoom back in. Wow. You guys, this is crazy.
this is completely ridiculous. Now I can't zoom back in. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Facebook Live needs to fix this so that way you can zoom in while recording because it would make life so much easier. I don't even know how I'm going to fix this, so I'm just going to... Put it on a different stand so give me a second guys to try and fix this so you can at least get a closer look okay the camera completely switched around like <laughs> this is ridiculous i tell you <sighs> okay um i'm gonna try to get it as close as i can for you guys without messing up everything okay hopefully you guys can still see this let me know if this is still a good view for you guys I don't know <laughs> but um, now I'm gonna write my notes and uh, starting off with verse 1 so starting off with verse 1 where I underlined that King Ahasuerus promoted Haman um, Haman is basically a very ungodly man but this shows that God can use him um, I mean, sorry, this shows that God had use of him being promoted, even though he was an ungodly man. God can use the unwise and the ungodly to fulfill his purpose or his promises to us. Um, so I'm going to write. Haman is ungodly. I'm going to use this index card to wipe off my pen quickly. Haman is ungodly, is, yeah, is ungodly, but God had use of his promotion shows that God can use the unwise and foolish sorry unwise and ungodly to fulfill his purpose and you'll you'll get what I mean as we continue on in the story but if you have read um, chapter 3 or read Esther in completion you all know that you all might know that um, Haman is not a very good person um i mean you clearly see at the end of this first paragraph that he wants to kill all of the jews simply because one person does not want to pay him any respect so you did what does it say Le leona and then for the second part of verse one and for those of you who are new or might be new later on watching um the reason why I write down the same verse multiple times is because I have different parts of that verse underlined. So that's why it might say verse 1 and verse 1. But um, the son of Hamethod, um, yeah, um, ha <laughs> Hamethodah. Yes, Leona, it definitely um is... Uh, violation of God's law but the reason why I didn't put that in um, the definition for this and I put to violate a command or law or to alienate or alter it is only because um, it says the king's command and the king isn't God um, but definitely yes transgression is to like violate God's law which is why we normally say that in uh, the our father prayer the Lord's prayer sorry <laughs> 
but hopefully that just made sense you guys know i say things sometimes and i feel like it don't make sense but it makes sense to you guys so hopefully that made sense what i just said like y'all know <laughs> if it didn't i'll repeat it if you need me to <laughs> but um okay so for where it says the son of i'm not even gonna attempt to say that name again and i don't know what this is on my nail yeah i did take off those acrylics because they were killing me and i ended up chopping my nails completely off <laughs> so yeah um, so basically, this portion here where it says the son of that person there, um, it's basically saying that Haman was a descendant of Ag, who was the king of the Amalekites, and they were the sworn enemies of the Israel of Israel for generations, and um, they were nomadic people who raided the Israelites. And I do have a cross reference for that, but um, I'm going to just write down what I needed to write my note down. So. Haman is a descendant of King. Okay, Leona. <laughs> of King Agag is just, I'm probably saying it completely wrong, but yep. Of Sorry I'm so quiet you guys, I'm trying to focus because I have my notes jotted on my computer and as I type them, they're just like up. Um, so I didn't have to like write it in a way that it makes sense and then also so that I can put them in the live notes in a sensible way. So yeah, <laughs> um, for generations, they were nomadic people. that raided Israel then see Exodus what are 17 8 through 16 and Deuteronomy 25 17 to 19 okay so the son of I'm not going to say that name because we already know I'm having problems saying that name. But um, my note for that is that Haman is a descendant of King Ag of the Amalekites. Amalekites were sworn, sworn enemies of Israel for generations. They were nomadic people that raided Israel. And then I have cross-reference for Exodus 17, 8 through 16, which I'm going to quickly flip to. And here it is on this page. And um, I'm just going to read it because I don't think you guys are going to be able to see it. Maybe if I move up. Okay, this part here where it says Israel defeats. Yep, I'm not, you know, I'm, I have a hard time pronouncing these names. So, yeah. Um, then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men, go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the mountain. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek, Amalek prevailed. But Moses's Moses's hand grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, "Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly." blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven and Moses built an altar and called it the name of 
and called the name of it the lord is my banner saying a hands upon the throne of the lord the lord will have war with amalek from generation to generation which proves that is the israelites and the amalekites always had problems and then i also had deuteronomy 25 17 19 right yeah I should probably um, start having my cross references already ready with post-it notes. <laughs> it would probably make more sense to do that. But um, I try to keep this as like authentic as possible while still showing you guys how you can go about it yourselves. But um, okay, what was it? 17 to 19. So 17 to 19 is here and it reads, remember what Amalek or Amalek I don't even know <laughs> did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt, how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and cut off your tail, those who were lagging behind you and he did not fear God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies around you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. I don't know if it's Amalek. I don't know if it's, I, I don't know, but you guys get the gist, hopefully. Um, okay. I'm hoping this is not going to be long because it's only 15 verses, but for some reason these sessions always end up being long. <laughs> so going to verse 2, all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage. So verse 2, I have that... Paying homage to a person of high ranking or influence was common. So, paying homage to a person of high ranking slash influence is common. And then I have a cross reference or two, actually two cross references. That's Second Samuel fourteen four, and then First Kings one sixteen. So okay, so fourteen four. When the woman of Tekal came to the king, she fell on her face to the ground and paid homage and said, Save me, O king. So this is a just regular woman bowing down to the king, giving him reverence. And then we have First Kings. And I just want to let you guys know, I'm going to have a massive book haul coming. <laughs> like the amount of books that I got this month is ridiculous so expect that to possibly be a three-part video just because I have so many books to share with you guys so just wanted to say that because I'm gonna be recording that this week hopefully but um first Kings 1 verse 16 says Beth Sheba bowed and paid homage to the king and the king said what do you desire so this is Beth Sheba a woman basically giving reverence to the king so that's just proof that giving, um, paying homage or showing reverence to a person of high ranking or influence was very common at this time. And let me know if you guys want me to slow down, if you want me to speed up, because I don't know. Sometimes I feel like I'm going too fast. Sometimes I don't feel like I'm going fast enough. But um, moving on to the part that I underlined. Uh, I hate this auto 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 focus. Oh my God, this is annoying. But um, the part that I underlined where it says Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Um, I feel like Mordecai must have seen something spiritually about Haman. Or he could have known about his ancestry. And um, that's just what I think. And also because of him being a Jew, he understood that bowing down to someone was basically putting them above God. And he possibly didn't even want to do that. Oh, that coffee was delicious. But, um, Mordecai, and I do have a cross reference for this as well. Um, so Mo Mordecai must have known.
Haman's ancestry. It's, but I'm going to leave it at that. Um, Mordecai must have known Haman's ancestry. And um, the cross-reference I have for that is 1 Samuel. Fifteen one through nine, and if you guys remember, I believe back, and yeah, I don't know why my notes are upside down on this page. Hold on, because <laughs> I have to reference back to this. But um, back in Esther chapter two, we found out some information about Mordecai's background in um verse 5 so it was um Esther chapter 2 verse is 5 yeah it said now there was a Jew in Susa the citadel whose name was Mordecai the son of Yair the son of Shemai the son of Kish of Benjamite so um that gives you background and lets you know that so, um, Saul was his descendant. So, this is going to be about King Saul and his stupidity, which I'm going to read right now. So, um, it's titled, The Lord Rejects Saul, and it was because Saul did something stupid that he wasn't supposed to do. So, Reading at the first verse, it says, And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have not, I have noted what um, Amalek, Amalek, you, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say Amalek from now on. I'm going to say Amalek. So, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel and opposing them on the way when they came out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have do not spare but kill both man and woman child and infant ox and sheep camel and donkey so saul summoned the people and numbered them in Tulane, 200 200 men on foot and ten thousand men of judah and saul came to the city of amalek and lay in wait in the valley then saul said to the kenites go to part go down from among the uh, amalekites <laughs> Least I destroy you with them, for you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites, and Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and best of the sheep and of oxen. And of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. Okay, sorry you guys if that didn't make sense. I'm a little bit out of breath and I'm still tired. So I'm going to try to snap out of it. But basically, God commanded Saul through Samuel to um, kill Amalek and all his people. That meant the king Agag. That meant, you know, children, babies all the animals he refused to kill the king and he allowed some of the animals to survive so that was why he basically was rejected from god you can read all of chapter 15 to understand it because after 15 then we understand that david gets anointed as king after saul but basically saul didn't kill agag which was the king of the amalekites which now brings us to this part where I was basically saying that um, Haman, where it says the Agite. And as I said, Agites are um, descendants from the royal family of the Amalekites. Oh, sorry, right here. No problem. I'm, I hope it's Shika. I'm probably pronouncing your name wrong. I need to know how to pronounce a lot of you guys' name. But no problem, and good morning. But, um... Yeah, so now that we understand the original history between Saul, which is Mordecai's descendant that we learned about in chapter 2, and then Agag, which is also Haman's descendant that we're just now learning in the first part of chapter 3, that's why I said what I said about Mordecai not wanting to bow down because it says Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. This is still kind of like... um. A continuation of that generational conflict between Israel and the Amalekites and that's why I actually 
titled chapter three um generational feud just because you can now see the hatred that Haman so carries from from his people from the king Agag with the Israelites hopefully that made sense <laughs> I'll have all of this written down in the notes for you guys. But um, yeah, Mordecai must have known Haman's ancestry. And then I had the cross-reference of 1 Samuel 15, 1-9, which is about Saul losing his place as king because he refused to kill Agag, which was also Haman's descendant that we learned back in verse 1. And Saul, back in chapter 2 of Esther, we learned is Mordecai's descendant. Hopefully that just made sense to everybody. But yeah, um... Moving on to, oh, nope, I'm not done. I'm going to write continuation of generational feud. And I mean, I don't know how many years this is apart between Esther and the accounts that happened in 1 Samuel. But um, this lets you know that people tend to hold grudges for years and I mean I'm pretty sure some of us have people in our own families who have had grudges that they don't even know why they have grudges but they don't like a specific person just because a great aunt from back 30 years ago had a problem with that person's relative I know I'm not the only person who got family members like that I'm just saying so this really just shows you like this is that it's normal this is stuff that happened back in the day that still happens to this day but um Verse 3, I had, why do you transgress the king's command? So, um, I feel like it must have been implied that the king commanded, um, everybody to bow down. But at the same time, I don't feel like he did because there, he doesn't say it specifically here. Like it said, for the king had so commanded concerning him. Um, so that just meant the servants. It didn't say anything about, you know, everyone else giving the king, um, giving Haman any type of reverence. So that's just what I'm getting just from reading these small three verses. So verse three, it must have been, must have been implied oh so bow before Haman but never commanded um, oh, by the king to the people. Um, it's kind of like, okay, so basically I said that it must have been implied to servants to bow before Haman, but never commanded by the king to the people in the Persian Empire. And I feel like it's one of those things like when you see, I'm going to use the president. And I don't mean the current president, but um, just any president, for example. Um, it's kind of implied that you would give the president respect because he's the president. But there's also no law commanding you to give that president respect. So it's kind of something that's implied. And that's how I feel like it went about in um, verse 3. Because I, I, I honestly believe that if Mordecai was commanded by the king to do so, he would have bowed down, but because he was not commanded to do so by the king, he didn't. So that's just what I'm getting. Like I said, it's only three verses that they really give you about this, but that's what I get from that. So let me know if you guys get anything different from that, where it says, why do you transgress the king's command when Mordecai refused to bow down? But um, going to verse four, it says he would not listen to them. They told Haman. And this was a part that I really really thought was interesting um so we see at the top that it says king ahasuerus promoted haman now there are some evil people in the world that do get promotions there are some evil people at work that you might feel shouldn't get the job promotion because they're stealing or whatever the case may be but um what i find interesting for verse four is that 
Heyman didn't even realize or notice that Mordecai wasn't paying, like wasn't giving him any type of reverence. And what I wrote is that clearly Heyman didn't know about this because he was too focused on all the praises given to him. So Heyman was too, too busy with um, all the praises and reverence from other people to really see Mordecai's um, actions. And I feel like this was a way for God to also fulfill his purpose in getting Mordecai more involved in the story of Esther. So... Heyman did not notice. Let me make sure my son's school didn't call. Because my son got sick <laughs> and was sick for about six days. But um, he finally went to school. Nope, my mother called me though. Ah. I'm going to have to call her back. So give me a quick second, guys. <laughs> Let me call my mother back. I forgot to tell her that I was... I'm doing Bible study, so give me one second. Sorry, guys. Sorry about that, guys. I had to call my mother back. But, um, okay. So, Heyman did not notice. Because he was concerned with other... Was concerned... With the praise from others... And who are these people? Uh, the servants. Okay, so God used the servants to make known the problem. I'm sorry about all the camera moving. <laughs> I'm just not seeing that, Leona. Really? That's awesome. I'm glad it's helping um, a lot because I'm finally, uh, how can I say, I guess, walking into my purpose, <laughs> if you will, um, because I was told years ago that I was to be a minister and um, I should be a minister in training, but I took myself out of that position. Literally after two weeks, I removed myself, um, but yeah. Yeah, Tanya, um, I don't, no one really knows. Um, I just think, well, I just know um, that it's common because, I mean, all the other books previous to this one will, will tell you about people, you know, bowing down to the king as a sign of respect. But um, also, <laughs> sorry for laughing, I was just reading Leona's um, comment. But um, 
But also, for Mordecai being a Jew, we know that for the Jews, they bowed down as an act of worship and reverence to God. So, for him, he would have looked at it differently compared to other people just bowing down. It's kind of like... Uh, it's kind of like how I'm, I'm, I'm going to use the Bible as an example. For us, we know what the Bible is. Um, I know as a kid, they used to say that Bible stood for the basic instructions before leaving earth. So as Christians, we understand that the Bible is the living word of God. We know what it is. But for non-Christians or non-believers or people who know nothing about, you know, God, to them, it's just a book. The same kind of thing with the whole bowing down. For the Jews, it meant a lot. It was significant. It was them giving worship to the one true God the one and only king but for other people it was just a sign of respect but um yeah leona i yeah i definitely did remove myself um i remember it clearly a bishop told me to sit in the front row with all the other ministers in training that were ba he basically promoted us kind of in a sense and had us sit in the front row and i sat in the front row for maybe two or three sundays and after that i completely moved myself back to like the third or fourth row just because I felt comfortable and um, at that time I was still dealing with a lot of depression and um, other things. I'm going to share my testimony. I have a very long testimony so it's going to be in parts. I'm definitely going to share my testimony soon but um, yeah I'm kind of happy that I did that though I should not have done that because it was definitely a gift from God but um, having done that I now see the purpose that um, the calling that I have and I'm now prepared for it. I mean I'm not ever going to be prepared but what I mean is that I'm more knowledgeable now and I understand a lot more than I did before so I'm actually going to a minister's uh class this weekend with my mom because my mom is an evangelist and um, I'm going to a minister's class with her and I'm super super excited because my first lady and them are going to be there so yes that went completely on a tangent but um thank you Stacy. <laughs> I definitely do a lot of research um definitely but, um, okay, because <laughs> my fiancé will be here soon, so you guys might hear him in the midst of this, and sorry for shaking the camera once again. I need to still figure out a better setup, because I'm always having problems, but, um, God used the servants to make known Mordecai to Haman, because I don't think Haman was even paying attention. So, yeah. That's what I got for where it says he would not listen, they told Haman. Um, again, the second part of verse 4 that I underlined, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And I'm going to do verse 4. So, this is yet again hinting towards some generational feud between the Agites and the Jews. Um, and it also could have been an act of idolatry to Mordecai because David tells us, um, that we are to bow down and worship the Lord alone and that is reserved for God alone. Um, and I have a cross reference, which is Proverbs 95 and 6. I don't even know what Psalms that was that um, I got that out of. I need to probably look that up and remember and put that in the notes. But um, Proverbs 25 and 6, 25 and 6. Or maybe it's supposed to be Psalms 25 and 6. I don't remember. I tell you, my notes are all over the place. <laughs> this is probably the realest Bible study that's live ever, you guys. Because I'm never completely prepared. No matter how prepared I get, I'm never prepared. Oh my gosh, I don't even remember. Okay, so when I remember the cross-reference, I'll let you guys know. Because I, I don't know where it is now. But, um, okay, but for, for he told them that he was a Jew, um, hints at generational feud. Between... Agites and Jews... Um, also seen as a form of idolatry. And 
And I'm actually going to look that up real quick, so. Yep. Okay, so, um, for he told him that he was a Jew, I put that this hints at the generational feud between the Agites and the Jews, and it's also seen as a form of idolatry to Jews to bow down to anyone or for anyone besides God. And this is written in the Psalms, but I can't remember, so now I have to look it up because I need to actually write that down because I don't have it written down for some reason. So... And I'm actually going to be going to Blue Letter Bible for this. Some kids are jumping. My coffee is still hot. I really like this coffee cup. I had got a coffee mug from um, Our Daily Bread. You guys know I love them. And, okay, this is not working. What is going on with life? Let's just click that. But, yeah. It's, um, I don't know if I can put it in the screen without spilling my coffee. It's this coffee mug here. Discover the word from Our Daily Bread. Um, honestly, I hate the coffee mug itself. The design is ugly. <laughs> but, um, it's actually been keeping my coffee cold. Coffee cold. Oh my god. My coffee hot. So, I'm just looking up the notes for this verse because I really need to find it. Um... Esther, 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 where are you? Chapter 3. If I can't find it on this page, I'll just have to find it later on. But, uh... can't find it can't find it can't find it and i'm not gonna stress out trying to find it so once i remember it it will be posted on the um live notes but um there's a psalm that talks about bowing down to god so yeah um moving on kindly to verse five um where it says haman was filled with fury oh with this camera stop shaking Um, Haman's pride got the best of him. He felt shamed by the fact of one person, especially a Jew, not reverencing him. His pride was ultimately his downfall. So, that's basic, basically what I got from him being angry. Because I don't feel like he should have been angry. You probably had everyone else in the kingdom bowing down before you, giving you the reverence and you know homage that you wanted. But because one person, specifically a Jew, did not bow down, now you're so angry with everyone. So, um, Haman's pride was his downfall. He let one person, a Jew, ignite him. And I think the cross-reference for that is Proverbs 16, 18. And I'm going to reread the note again, of course. But Proverbs 16, 18. Sixteen eighteen says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And that's pretty much everything that... Haman was <laughs> so um again I wrote that Haman's pride was his downfall he let one person a Jew ignite him for verse 6 we have two points so the first point but he disdained to lay his hands on Mordecai alone um to me, what I'm getting, just like I said, from these first three verses, what I'm understanding about that portion of the verse 
is that, you know, he knew that killing Mordecai on his own was wrong. He knew it was um, something that shouldn't be done, but he plotted to have his revenge. So... He did not want to kill alone, knowing it was wrong. He plotted, sought revenge. But God doesn't like a heart of vengeance. And there's a cross reference for that, but um, so where it says, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. I put that he did not want to kill alone knowing it was wrong he plotted sought revenge but god doesn't like a heart of vengeance and the cross reference cross reference for that is ezekiel 25 15 16 and um it's right here it says, Thus saith the Lord God, because the Philistines acted vengefully and took vengeance with malice of soul to destroy and never end in enmity. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will stretch out my hand against the Philistines. I will cut off the Cherethites and destroy the rest of the sea coast. Um, so this is basically telling you that, you know, the Philistines were vengeful. They had vengeance in their hearts and God basically cut them off. Same kind of ordeal with Haman. Haman is filled with vengeance, um, and again, generational vengeance. And he's upset with Mordecai for not bowing down, giving him homage, paying him reverence, whatever you want to call it. And now he's seeking and plotting, as you guys can see in the next part where it says Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai. He's now plotting to seek his revenge on one person by killing the mass and, um, as we will see, of course, as we continue reading on Esther, that God basically got rid of Haman <laughs> because of the vengeance in his heart. So, Ezekiel 25, 16, I mean 15 to 16. And then the last part of verse 6, where it says that he sought to destroy all the Jews, um, the people of Mordecai, his anger with one man made him take his wrath out on all like Mordecai, which then exposed his true hatred for the Jewish people. So, his anger, I'm not going to say hatred, um, his anger with one made him take, made him take it take out his wrath on all exposed his hatred for Jews and the cross reference I have for that is Proverbs 12 um, 6 through 8. So it's down here at the bottom. It says, The words of the wicked lie in wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright delivers them. The wicked are overthrown and are no more, but the house of the righteous will stand. A man is commended according to his good sense, but one of twisted mind is despised. So, um, Haman definitely was a twisted person. Um, I mean, one person should not have made you that angry to want to kill the masses. I feel like... It not only exposed his true generational hatred for the Jews, 
but um it shows how ungodly how unwise how just human as well as what's the word i'm looking for let me pop the comments back up what is the word that i'm looking for i can't think oh my gosh It shows how weak he was as a person because I feel like if you're having a problem with one person, you should speak to that one person or he could have at least brought it to the king's attention. But instead, he was so weak with his anger that um, he allowed the anger to overtake him. And instead of just dealing with Mordecai, he now wants to kill all the people that are Jewish. Like that just shows his weakness. That shows how easy it is to anger him. And um, it, it actually teaches me myself to um deal with my anger a little bit better because there are times when i can get angry with one person and take it out on everyone um when it's not needed and yeah this this verse six really did show me a lot about myself personally but um that is that so now we're going to underline um oh i'm sorry you guys this is like ugh. i need to figure out a better system a better better system for doing these i got a large table i just gotta figure out a way to set up the tripod now but i am just first four marking with the highlighters I need to start doing this as I um, make my notes just to make it easier for myself because this gets annoying to have to do it after the fact. And I believe that is my fiance ringing the doorbell. So you guys might hear him walk in the room. <laughs> what time is it? It is 11.28. It's almost 12 o'clock. Oh my gosh. We're probably going to be here a little longer today. So, I apologize. Alright, let me just get my post-it notes together. And there he is. You can come in. Oh, lies. Oh, okay. So, um... Reading verse 7 through 11. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, the twelfth of the year of King Ahasuerus, they cast per, that is, they cast lots, before Haman day after day. And, the cast, and they cast it month after month till the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad, dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. Verse 9, If it, is, if it pleases the king, 
Let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay ten thousand talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, the king's business, that they might that they may put it into the king's treasures. Verse ten. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman the Agite, the son of Hamethra. I don't know, you guys know, <laughs> the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. So, you guys know the drill. We're going to circle. The first word that I'm going to circle is Nisan. I'm also going to circle, I think I circled Per. I'm not 100% sure. Let me look back at my notes. I did, okay. So, I circled Per. I circled Adar. I also circled talent and signet. Signet. So where is talent? And signet. So you know the drill lets to find these lovely words. So Nissan. And I actually have a chart to show you guys in my other Bible. If I can get it. But um, okay. So Nisan is the first month of the Jewish religious year, which is basically considered between March and April. Um, so first month in the Jewish calendar. Considered March to April. Um, per is basically lot, which they actually say they cast lots. So per is just lot. There's nothing else to it. It's just lot. Adder. Sorry about all the shaking. You guys know I got to figure out a whole nother setup, like I said, because the shaking is ridiculous. Adder is the 12th month in the Jewish calendar, which is equal to February to March. So, twelfth month in Jewish calendar. This is considered February, March. Talents. is a measure of weight or money and I think the last one is signet and that is a seal used officially to give Personal authority All right, so the words that I circled are Nisan, which is basically the first month in the Jewish calendar, which is considered March and April. Per is Lot. Adar, which I circled here, is the 12th month in the Jewish calendar, which is considered February to March. Talent is a measure of weight or money. And then Signet, which is a seal used officially to give personal authority to a document in lieu of a signature. So it's just a little seal that's on a ring that the king would pass along to whoever to um, basically sign a document. So let's use some color because I need color in my life. Uh oh, I don't want that to stick down. And I'm going to quickly show you guys a chart of the actual calendar that I have in my.
King James Study Bible. So if you guys do own a study Bible, you should be able to find a chart or something that discusses the Jewish calendar. And again, I'm sorry for the shaking. I just hit the uh, camera. We're going to figure it out, you guys. <laughs> And signets. So let me actually just grab that Bible quickly. If I can grab that. Where is it? Where is it? Alrighty then. Hopefully you guys can see this. Uh, it's the Jewish sacred calendar. So you have Nisan here, which is the first month of the sacred calendar. It used to be called Abib, um, and it's March to April, and it has 30 days, and it was referenced in Esther 3-7. And then Adar... Down here is February, March, and it's 29 or 30 days, and it tells you where it was referenced multiple times in Esther, actually, Esther 3, Esther 8, Esther 9, and yeah, pretty much. So, if you guys have a study Bible, definitely check a study, your study Bible to learn more about the um, Jewish calendar. But now moving on for the notes, and I'm just going to write those notes on the side here. And this was verse, what, seven? So for this, I just, I'm going to underline. Which is the month of Nisan. And then up here, I'm going to write a note. Which is that Nisan was formerly... A bib, and this was the month Okay, guys, sorry, I had to write this note down. But, um, Nisan was formerly a bib, which I did show you guys in the calendar, which was the month that God brought Israel out of Egypt. And it's also um, the month that the Jewish celebrate Passover on the 14th. And the cross reference I have for that is Deuteronomy 16.1. So let's flip to that. 16, uh oh. 16 and 1. Down here, if you guys can see it, it says, Observe the month of Abib, which is also Nisan, and keep the Passover to the Lord your God, for in the month of Abib, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. So that's the note that I had, and I'm going to use gray. Just so that I can still see my other notes and highlights. Okay. Going on to verse 8. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. So I'm going to underline there is a certain people scattered abroad. 
and dispersed among the peoples. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's law so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. So I'm underlining that part right there. They do not keep the king's law so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. Skipping to verse 9. Um, let it be decreed that they be destroyed. Oh my god, this pen keeps bumping into the camera. I will pay 10,000 talents of silver. And yeah, okay. So I'm going to use yellow. I don't know why I'm using yellow if I'm going to have to write on that post it. Let's grab a new post it note. Nope, that's too small. So I'm going to quickly show you guys my stash of post-its. <laughs> oh, if I can get it in the camera. I keep all of my post-its in this Victoria's Secrets box. You can't see it all. But, um, I have so many post-its in here. So, yeah. I'm just going to grab probably the pink one. No, I'm going to use the orange one, actually. So I'm going to use yellow, I'm going to use blue, I'm going to use this blue green, and it's purple. I'm going to underline in verse 10, gave it to Haman the Agite, the enemy of the Jews. I'm going to underline that in brown because Haman is terrible. And in verse 11, did I even keep reading you guys? I don't remember. <laughs> So I'm going to reread verse 11. Um, and the king said to Haman, the money is given to you, the people also to do with them as it seems good to you. I'm just going to underline all of verse 11. And I'm going to use orange for that. But verse 8, the note where I said there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples. I wrote that um, the Israelites throughout the Israelites were throughout many places because of their disobedience. And um, so. I do too, Leona. The unicorn posters are so cute. I'm I'm trying so hard not to use them up because I do have three packs, but like I feel like if I start using them, I'm never going to stop, which is why I only use them once, and I probably will end up using them the rest of the study because they are too darn cute. But, um, okay, the Israelites were throughout... lands due to disobedience and then the cross reference i have for that was psalms 
44 and 11. Let's flip to that. 44 and 11. Forty-four, eleven. You have made us like sheep for slaughter, and you have scattered us among the nations. So this is just telling you that, um, for sure, the Israelites, the Jews, were scattered throughout the nations, and we all know about their disobedience to God. So, okay, and also they do not keep the king's law, so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. Um, basically, Haman was feeding the king half truths, and he basically dis saying that they did not disregard. I'm sorry, hold on. Okay, so Haman, when he said they do not keep the king's law, so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. One, he's feeding them um, the king half truths because we definitely know for a fact that obviously the Jews were different. Um, they had their own laws, their own rules that they abided by. But um, this didn't mean that they didn't keep to the king's laws. They definitely did um, listen to the king, especially if it was nothing that went against their own laws concerning God. So Haman was definitely feeding the king half truths. Haman fed the king. Half truths. Um, the Jews definitely did not disregard the king, and at least they were a quiet people who had their laws but still kept to the king. So, had their laws. But still. To the king. Cross reference for that I had was Psalms thirty six four. Flipping back to Psalms because Psalms is just like the best. Thirty six thirty six okay thirty six four. He plots trouble while on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not reject evil. So, this is really more so concerning the king and Haman. Just because Haman is completely lying to the king, basically. And um, the king is just sitting there listening to him. So, Haman is just building himself a bed of lies that he obviously falls through into um, during the rest of the book of Esther. So moving on to verse 9 where it says, let it be decreed that they be destroyed. I am going to use, where's the post-it? This one here. What verse was that? 9? Um, basically, this is Haman's operation beginning with his words to organize the mass murder or the genocide of the Jews. His tongue twisted the truths and brought destruction. And I have a cross-reference which is Psalms 52 and 2. So, um, I'm going to say see Psalms 52 verse 2. Haman's plan. Beginning. For genocide of Jews. His tongue twisted. Truth and brought destruction. So, uh, let it be decreed that they be destroyed. This is Haman's plan. Beginning for genocide of Jews. His tongue twisted truths and brought destruction. And the cross reference I have is Psalms 52.2. And once again, my mother is calling me. So I'm going to have to call her back. Psalms 52 and 2 is on this side. It says, Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, you worker of deceit. 
And um, Haman definitely was a worker of deceit, but considering who his ancestors were, being Agag and the Amalekites, you guys know I'm having problems with that word. But um, give me a quick second, guys, to call my mother <laughs> back again. Okay, guys, sorry about that. I have to call her back and tell her to stop calling until I'm done. <laughs> um, but, yeah. So, yeah, um, like I was saying, Haman is definitely a worker of deceit. He definitely was a deceitful person. And then the last part of verse 9, I believe, which says, I will pay 10,000 talents of silver. This is basically bribery. Um, this is a promise of a bribe. This was a bribe that was obtained from the property of the slaughtered innocent ones so verse 9 Haman what do I want to say Haman bribed is what I'm gonna write he bribed it's as simple as that so let me just do these real quick we're almost done, guys. There's only a few more verses left. Okay, so on to where it says, gave it to Haman the Agite, the enemy of the Jews. Um, verse 10. This is basically clear proof that this is more personal. Um, that is more than personal, but also generational. More proof. That this is more than personal. But generational. And I mean that because it says gave it to Haman, the Agite, the enemy of the Jews. And we know back from verse 1, I think it was. Let me just let me check. Verse 1, um, yeah, that I wrote that Haman is a descendant of King Agag of the Amalekites, and the Amalekites were sworn enemies of Israel for generations. So this is just proof that this is more personal than him. It's not just about, of course, his pride, but it's also generational for him. So let me just stick that one there. Keep all the notes together. Um, and then for verse 11, the king said to Haman, the money is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it is good to you. And let me just fix this camera a bit because we're now going to the last part. But for verse 11, I'm basically saying that it shows that the king trusted Haman's advice. Um, he trusted that Haman was giving him wise and sound advice, but he had no idea of how wrong Haman's advice was, how foolish it was, how full of lies it was. Um, and this is just showing that Haman knew how to prey on the king. So, verse 11. The king trusted Haman. And my phone is slowly dying. <laughs> the king trusted Haman. And Haman prayed on that kindness. Okay, 
Okay, so I'm just going to write verse 12. So now to the last paragraph. Verse 12, then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month in an edict according to all that Haman commanded was written to the king, satraps, and um, satraps. And I'm actually going to circle the words as I read so that we can go through this quicker. Um, to the governors over all the provinces and to the officials of all the people to every province in its own script and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of king ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring the letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instructions to destroy to kill and to annihilate i'm also going to circle that all jews young and old women and children in one day the 13th day of the 12th month which is the month of adar and to plunder their goods i also will circle plunder a copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa the citadel, and the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. So I'm going to write the definitions on this side. So set traps. is basically a subordinate official such as a henchman or a lieutenant. I'm going to put lieutenant. Annihilate is to cause to cease to exist. Do away with. So nothing remains and plunder. Let me just check my camera battery again. Take by force. I'm going to take this orange highlighter for verse 11 again. Okay. And we are finishing up. So verse 12, um, it was written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with, where, where is that? Uh, here we go. The last line of verse 12, it was written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. Um, basically, it would make uh, sure that the governmental level in the Persian Empire would adhere to the king's decree. So, sorry. Adhere to the king's decree. And um, the signet ring was a symbol of executive power. And the imprint was equivalent to a legally binding signature. So the king was therefore giving him an authority to issue a decree in his name.
that's all I have for verse 12. Sorry, so um, verse 12, it was written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring, would make sure the governmental levels in the empire would adhere to the king's decree, and the king gave Haman authority to issue a decree in his name. Moving on to verse 13. Um, okay, so... King's provinces with instructions to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews in one day. And where is it? Oh, sorry. So, King's provinces with instructions to destroy, and to kill, and to annihilate all Jews in one day. And to plunder their goods. That whole verse 13 part I'm going to write. Um, that an empire-wide genocide would happen in one day to kill all Jews in Persian Empire. And for the last verse, 15, I'm going to underline this last line, which says, The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Um, the king thought everything was all well, and he did not understand the true meaning of what he had declared on the people. And Haman, on the other hand, was excited and happy that his plan was going through, or so he thought. So for the king, so all was well. And then I have a cross-reference to Proverbs 25 and 19, which I'm going to quickly read that, and then we'll be done. 25 and 19 reads, Trusting in treacherous men in times of trouble is like a bad tooth or a foot that slips. So, basically, the king and Haman were sitting down, Haman, sorry, I said Haman, but um, the king and Haman were sitting down to eat and they were being merry. The king trusted in Haman and his trust kind of sort of blinded him to the truth of Haman while Haman was basically just using the signet ring, using his authority out of um, what it should have been used as. He was taking advantage of that authority and using it to get rid of a people that did nothing to him. He just had a generational grudge and a personal problem with Mordecai. But, um, that is pretty much it for chapter 3. I'm sorry that it was actually longer than it should have been. Um, we're still kind of in the time frame. It's only 12.04 right now, so we're good. But, um, yeah, here is chapter 3, the notes that we took for the day. Hope you guys can see all of that. Our post-its, oh, sorry about knocking the camera, are here. So, four post-it notes. But, um, yeah, chapter 3 was really all about Haman and Mordecai's um, generational feud and how God used Haman to put his purpose and his plan in action 
And um, a lot of people would read this and be upset, like, why is God doing this? Why is he allowing all of this to happen to his people? But um, everything that he does has a purpose. His purpose in promoting Haman was to use Haman in saving his people. And then he also used Haman to allow Mordecai to have more of a in-depth storyline, if you will, within the story of Esther. Because without Mordecai, I feel like Esther wouldn't have been able to save her people, which we, we will get into as we continue reading. But um, yeah, that's pretty much it for this study. I'm going to pop my notes here. If I can. And I always get this wrong because I always put them on backwards so we're going to try to fix this stick that on first there we go and there so yeah those are my notes that is everything for today uh, thank you guys for watching as usual and the live notes will be up soon I'm going to type them up edit them up whatever I have to do and then I'm also going to start downloading all of the videos so that I can post them onto YouTube so you guys can see it later on because I know a lot of you guys are having a tr having trouble with um, watching them on Facebook for some reason but uh, that's pretty much it thank you Stacy thank you Leona <laughs> Yeah, see, my brother's starting with the drums, so I'm glad I'm finally done. You probably hear that. If you do, I apologize. But, um, yeah, I'm going to end here, and I will see you guys in the next video, which will be next week, most likely. <laughs> and um, definitely make sure you guys read the Battle Plan of Prayer. Do the study guide cha um, for day three, as well as read chapter three. And I think that's pretty much all that I can remember right now. So I will see you guys in the next video. Bye!